Hi, it's Dre Griggs with Obsidian Wisdom. Today we answer the question, why do people fail to achieve their financial goals? Today we'll talk about four aspects of financial goal planning and why some people fail to achieve them. Now, you may be wondering, well, what's the difference between a life goal and a financial goal? And the truth is, there really isn't a difference. Whatever your life goals are, you're generally going to need some sort of money to be able to fund it. If your goal is to start a nonprofit or a charity, you'll find you spend a good amount of time raising money to make sure that you're able to properly fund the events. The same is true even if you were to go to a church where they collect money because you have to be able to fund the mission trips and the, the food that you donate and different things where ultimately money is a way that we show our values. So we shouldn't inherently think something positive or negative about money. You simply show me a person, I show you what they're doing with their money, and then we can decide whether that is a positive or negative use of the money. But at the end of the day, money is simply a tool to exchange for something we find value in. If you are not achieving your financial goals, the first place to look is whether you have a plan in place you'll find that most people don't actually have a plan in place and what I mean by a plan is not a dream where you thought of something but a plan in the sense that you wrote down exactly what you wanted and you look at the sheet you wrote your goals on at least once a day where ideally you would read your goals in the morning you would read them in the evening you would keep them on the front of your mind as a result, you would then be training yourself to recognize different opportunities to achieve your goals. You want to be intentional with your time and your money when it comes to achieving your life and financial goals. If you are not being intentional, what ends up happening is, is whatever the shiny thing is of the day, we will say, you know what, that's what I want to spend my money on. And then we do. And then you would find the opportunity you're not ready for when it does show up. It's no different than if I go shopping with one of my daughters. If we go on one aisle, she will say, oh, that's a toy I never knew I always wanted. Oh, we have to get it, dad. Oh, can we please get it? And more times than not, I usually ask her, what is it about this particular item that excites you? What is it that interests you? Because you've never mentioned it to me before. And I'm trying to get her to think just for a split second that maybe I don't want this. Maybe I met someone and it looked like they were having fun so I thought that I would have fun doing it too where someone goes on vacation and you just feel a little bit more tired where you're like maybe I should go on vacation they're sharing all the pictures of the cruise and all the fun things they got to do and you're like man maybe maybe I should find something to be able to do some trip for me to be able to take which is totally fine if you want to take the trip but what is it that made you want to take the trip was it that you wanted to go on the trip or was it that they just seemed like they really enjoyed the trip the same can be true with different food where somebody orders some food and you're watching them and you're like, man, that looks really delicious the way that that person is eating it. But then we get the food and we're like, mm, that's not quite as good as I thought it was because we have different taste buds. And what you'll realize is if we don't have a set plan in place, something that's going to keep us grounded, something that we're working towards, it becomes very difficult for us to not be swayed by the events of the day. Things that seem great today, but maybe we would regret tomorrow where we make our decisions in the short term nature where we're like, okay, this would feel really good today, but would it feel good in a month from now? Would it feel good a year from now or five years from now? But if you have a plan where ideally I would have you write down at least 20 things that you are looking to have in your life and then you would price those 20 things. What would it cost for you to be able to achieve that goal? Some of them aren't going to cost you anything, but most of them will have some sort of a financial component tied to it. And so if you're not achieving your financial goals, what values are you assigning to your money? And are you okay with those values? The second reason that people fail to achieve their financial goals is they have no understanding of what would actually make them happy. What would bring them joy in their life? Where would they actually want to spend their time? What type of experiences would they want to create? It is not enough to simply write down some goals, some wishes, some dreams that we have. It is very important for us to focus on why we have those goals, why we have that ambition, and why we have those dreams. Where we may on the surface level think that we will be happy if we are able to buy a house or a certain car, but when you go a step deeper, we may realize that we're interested in a house, not for the sake of having a house, but maybe we want to appear successful. Maybe we feel we're giving a lot to our job and we just want to be able to have something in return where we feel like this is why I'm doing it. This is what makes it worth it. 
I have many clients who want to spend money in certain ways because they don't want their parents to worry about them. And their parents have a high value on spending money on a house or a car or living in a certain neighborhood. And as a result, they do these things not because they really want them, but because they want to give their parents peace of mind. There are a variety of ways that we spend our money, and it's not always that we spend our money on what it is that we actually want, things that bring us peace, joy, and happiness. But when you understand the reason why you're doing something, when you just take that extra second to simply allow yourself to really explore, meditate on your goals, really reflect on why is that on my list, and I encourage people all the time that those reasons will change. The reasons that you wanted something in 20 are going to be very different when you're 30 and they'll be significantly different by the time you're like 50 or 60. And so it's important to at least look at your list, understand what your 20 year old self was looking for, and then see if that's still important for your 30 year old self. Understand what your 30 year old self was looking for, how they were interpreting life and their values, and see if that still makes sense at 50. You have to allow yourself to not simply go after things just because it was on the list, but to really investigate whether those things will bring you joy and contentment. We all want to feel progress, but progress isn't progress if it's not actually bringing us towards something. We have to be able to look at our goals, and then we need to be able to understand why we put those goals there, and then we need to be very realistic about the timeline. Understanding the cost both in money and time is very important for us to be able to achieve our financial goals. We don't want to make a 10-year financial goal that we expect to achieve in two years because we'll be very discouraged and it may cause us to give up before we even are halfway there. I often encourage people to make their plans based on a five-year time frame. It's very unrealistic to set a goal to achieve something massive in one year, which is often what society teaches us where every new year you set this new goal, but most goals aren't one-year goals. It's important to judge your goal, whether it's a one-year goal, a three, five, or a 10-plus year goal. And then you need to align your actions in the short term to help you achieve the long-term goals. And the third reason people don't achieve their financial goals is they don't have the courage. When you don't have courage, it's very difficult to leave your comfort zone. Our comfort zone is comfortable. It's things that we've done and have been doing. It's things that feel good and natural to us, where it feels very easy for us to be able to do something. There are areas where people are uncomfortable, and it's not that something is impossible to understand, it's just we don't have an understanding of it yet, and that discomfort keeps us from trying new things. So with my kids, they enjoy certain books. I take them to the library, and if I let them, some of them would pick the same book out every single weekend. They found a great book, and they enjoy that book, and for them, there's no reason to try a different book. Now, one cool thing that the library does is the librarian will give you books that your kid will like based on the previous book that they liked, where they group the books in a certain way where it's not really a stretch for your child if they like one book to like the next book within that certain grouping. And I often will have my children, I'm like, hey, just ask them, tell them the books that you like, and then see what they'd recommend. We can read a page or two and it's okay. Again, failure is just a feedback loop. It's nothing to be discouraged about. If you like the book, great, we'll keep reading it. If you don't like the book after the first chapter, that's fine, we'll give it back and get a new book. But don't be discouraged from trying something. Society raises us from an early age to fear failure, to avoid failure, to see it as a negative thing. But it's important for us to recognize that failure is nothing more than a feedback loop. It is simply us trying something and then getting the information we need to make different adjustments along the way. For my kids, the feedback is, I like this book. What do you like about the book? Well, I like the main characters, that they have this personality. Or one of them may say, I like the fact that there are some pictures in the chapters. That's fun. Another one of my younger kids may say, I just like the feeling of finishing a book. So I like to pick shorter books so I can get that feeling. All is fine. It is simply the feedback loop. The same is true for us in our professional and financial lives. If our goal is to make a certain income and we're not able to get promoted that first year, it doesn't mean we should never try for the promotion again. If someone says that being promoted is not all it's tracked up to be, that you get a lot more work and a lot less money, a lot less freedom and a lot less time, to where we're very discouraged from leaving the present area that we know. Even if we're not super excited about our present environment, the fact that we know it makes us feel that much more comfortable than the possibility of being happier by making a change 
but the discomfort of that transition where we're just like, I don't really want to go through that. I don't like that feeling of the halfway where I don't really know what's going on. The environment's completely new versus where I'm at now, where I have this reputation and this name and I have the perfect route that I go to work. I know all the places I can eat for lunch afterwards where I just don't feel a lot of comfort trying new things. And the same is true when it comes to how do we get our money to work for us? Most of the financial goals that people have requires them to have control of their time where they have to have the freedom, which is why financial freedom is so important for most people, even though 80% of the country lives paycheck to paycheck. Well, why is that? Why is it that everybody appreciates financial freedom, but eight out of 10 people are living paycheck to paycheck where they have no financial freedom? And a lot of the time it is tied to the fact that we are in some aspect of our life where we have to take a leap of faith. We have to stretch out of our comfort zone. For some, that is investing in the stock market where they know that they have a certain check and their money comes in, they have certain bills that they pay, and the idea of putting my money in the stock market to get a return is very uncomfortable for them. Where we have these conversations where they're like, look, I like the idea of a guaranteed income, which is fine, but how much is a guaranteed income worth to you? And what I mean is, if the person investing your money is going to say, you know what, I guarantee you 3% every year, no matter what, for them to stay in business, they have to make more than the 3%. Because if they make 2% and they pay you the 3%, they can only do that so many years before they're out of business. So if that means that this company is able to go out there and make four, five, six, 10% of return, where they then have their profit, and then they give you a little bit from your own money that they invested and made that profit, how much is the guaranteed income worth? Now, some of you would say, well, Dre, if they're making 5%, I'm okay giving 2% to them for me to have the guaranteed 3% because I don't think they're always going to make the 5%, which is totally fine. But what if they're making 10, 15, 20% every year? Is that guaranteed return worth 17% of your money because they're making 20% and they're just giving you that guaranteed 3%? It's very important to recognize that wherever we feel fear and discomfort, it just means we don't have a good understanding around the situation. It's no different than someone who's in the circus and walks a tightrope every single day. For you and I, we would want a safety net underneath because we would be so uncomfortable. But for someone who walks a tightrope every day, they're okay walking across New York skyscrapers without a net underneath because they do it all the time. For them, it's no different than walking down the street. For us to leave our comfort zone, it's built in the repetition where we are continually introducing ourselves just a little bit at a time outside of our comfort zone to where we build the confidence in whatever it is that we're trying to do. And then we have the courage to take action. Fear is not something to just outright be ignored. It's often a message that's saying, I'm not very comfortable with what we're talking about here. I should learn a little bit more about it. I should increase my comfort. Then you will look back and say, now I'm ready to do this. It's not a sign that I should never do it. I should never try it. It's simply a sign that I need to build comfort around this. What more can I learn about this? How can I expose myself to this information to help me along the way? In the fourth and final way that people fail to achieve their financial goals is they have a low economic value. So our economic value is tied to how much value we bring the world. And now we're not talking about your value as a whole. Of course, there are lots of value that we can create in the world. We're simply talking about your economic value and how it ties to your financial goals. If you increase your economic value, you will increase the amount of money that you get back from the economy. The more people that you're able to help, the more of a reward you will receive back. Entrepreneurship is the best way for you to generate your wealth because you provide a significant value to a wide array of people. If you were to ask me, Dre, what do you think is one of the most valuable professions? I would probably say maybe a brain surgeon because your brain controls everything. It's your movement, it's your thought, it's your motor skills. Your brain is a very important faculty of your body. It sends all of the nervous system electrons throughout your whole body. And so anyone who could do brain surgery is a phenomenal and very valuable person in the economy. But because they can only provide value to one person at a time, their value is limited based on that time. Even if we are very generous and we said that they did one brain surgery every single day, so 365 times, and they were paid, I don't know, $100,000 for each brain surgery that they did, they would make $365,000 a year. And while that is a very significant value, we also know that there are professional athletes who make more than that every single year. 
Well, you would say, well, being an athlete, that's not more valuable than being a brain surgeon. But economically, it is. And why is that? It's because a professional athlete, they fill up a stadium with 10 to 50,000 people and they provide a value to every single one of them. Not to mention they have TV deals to where they're streaming some of these events that's providing value to millions of people. So as a result, while their value may not be as significant as a brain surgeon, their value is multiplied over a wide array of people. And as a result, they are able to generate a much higher income than a brain surgeon because their craft enables them to provide a value to millions of people at a time. So even if each of those people gave him $1, they would still make over a million dollars every single year. And as a result, that is how you have to look at value. The same with CEOs, where their leadership is believed to generate billions of dollars for a certain company. Wouldn't you pay them hundreds of millions of dollars if they're generating you billions of dollars? Wouldn't you pay someone billions of dollars if they were generating you trillions of dollars? And for most people, the answer is yes. If you are providing me enough value, I am willing to pay you a significant amount of money. The good news is each of us have the ability to increase our value over any given period of time. For some, that may require you to work a little bit longer. For others, that may require you to increase your education or your certifications and your trainings. For many, it often requires you stepping out of that comfort zone and doing work that you're not necessarily being paid for right now, but it showcases your ability to add the additional value to the point that they will recognize you. And if you're not recognized because of the politics or whatever that's going on in the company, then I would say you should provide value economically through some sort of a business. Whether you own the business or whether you have a pool of friends that put the money together to start or fund a business, or whether you're just investing in real estate or in the stock market to where you are an owner in a company. You are now a silent partner. For you to achieve your financial goals, you are going to have to increase your economic value. And that's a great thing. You should be more valuable over time. You should increase your skill set and your knowledge and your understanding. You should be seen as a leader and they should reward you for it. If you like the video, I ask you to like and subscribe and feel free to check out other wisdom metric videos. If you're looking for ways to eradicate financial stress, generate passive income, and build a prosperous retirement strategy.